We haven't stopped at the uh, information booth, the little booth up there with the red tent. Please do. It uh, kind of shows you where you and your families can uh, stop at uh, the uh, passport for safety, uh, and also again to the opportunity to visit a lot of the vendors. Uh, I just want to say thank you again to uh, our public education team that put all of this together. And again, it's just not people from the fire rescue organizations. As I mentioned before, we have people, we have uh, Kelsey here from uh, Randy, both from uh, Gurney Mills, that have just done uh, a tremendous job helping us out uh, with the marketing end of things, and of course, many, many other things. So now I'm gonna turn this over to one of our one of the fire lieutenants from uh, the city of New York uh, that will be providing the, the tours here today of this exhibit. Uh, this this is just phenomenal. Uh, I can, you know, probably many weren't uh, born or were probably very young, you know, when this incident happened, but truly to take the time uh, to go through this exhibit and uh, to see what uh, fire rescue, EMS, law enforcement, what, what, what all these people did, uh, did, you know, their job uh, to hopefully save people uh, during this uh, tra tragic event. So, again, thank you very much for attending today, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Lieutenant. Thank you. Teddy home to play golf with his brothers. When he heard a report on the scanner, the first plane hit the North Tower. Stephen turned his truck around, went back to squad one. They had already been assigned to the World Trade Center. He grabbed his firefighting gear, threw in his truck, and began to head into Manhattan to the World Trade Center. He got as far as the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, which had already been closed. Stephen left his truck there, put his 60 pounds of gear on his back, ran through the tunnel to the World Trade Center, where Stephen and 342 other firefighters died that day, saving lives at the World Trade Center. His family was devastated. Stephen was the youngest of seven brothers and sisters. His father died when he was eight years old, and his mother died when he was nine. So he was an orphan, and he was raised by his brothers and sisters. They did a tremendous job. Stephen grew up, became a New York City firefighter, married his wife Sally. They had five children together, the youngest being one year old when Stephen died. Stephen was 34 years old when he died. The family wanted to do something to honor his service and his heroism, so they came up with a plan to follow Stephen's footprints through the tunnel to the World Trade Center. They developed a run, a 5K run. It's about two and a half miles from the tunnel to the Trade Center. Um, it was a very successful uh, run. The very first year, about 1,500 people participated. Uh, last year, over 30,000 people participated in this event. Uh, I've, I've participated or volunteered in it every year. It's a really great, great event to be part of. Uh, the foundation kind of grew from there. They started donating money to orphanages in Stephen's name. But in 2011, they started the program called Building for America's Bravest, which to me kicked the foundation to another level. They started building smart homes for our catastrophically injured veterans. Um, these homes are run by computers. Uh, they operate off an iPad. Uh, the lights, the TVs, the air conditioning and heating all operates off the iPad. The counters lower and raise, cabinetry lowers and raises, so they're handicap accessible. The bathrooms are very accessible, uh, wheelchair accessible, and these homes are, are very wheelchair accessible, handicap accessible homes. The very first one was built for uh, U.S. Army Sergeant Brendan Morocco. Brendan uh, was injured in Iraq on uh, Easter Sunday, 2009. His vehicle was hit with an IED. Brendan lost both his arms and legs. He became the first quadriplegic amputee survivor. He endured many surgeries. Frank Silla met him at World to Read Army Hospital in 2011. Frank is Stephen's older brother and the CEO of the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. And he wanted to do something to help this young man come, uh, coming back to being a civilian. So along with the board of directors of the foundation and sponsors, they built this smart home program. The foundation also honors our military and first responders, gold star families, when soldiers, police officers, or firefighters are killed in the line of duty. The foundation steps in, they have small children at home. The foundation steps in and pays the mortgages for these homes and these families. 
to help ease the burden of their loss of their loved one. They also started a, a, a branch of the foundation called Operation Home Base. Uh, they're giving smart homes, tiny homes, excuse me, tiny homes to our homeless veterans across the nation. All veterans who honestly served, honorably served our nation in peacetime or war deserve our nation's gratitude. The motto of the foundation is, while we are here, let us do good. And the foundation has started the Let Us Do Good Village. They cleared land in Land Lakes, Florida to build the Let Us Do Good community. It's going to be 100 homes in this community where recipients can live and heal together in this community. The Tunnel to Towers Foundation is a sound, fiscally, fiscally sound managed. It's rated four star by Charity Navigator. It's the highest rating you can receive at 95 cents on every dollar goes directly to our programs and services. So that brings us to this incredible 9-11 Never Forget exhibit. It's a tribute to all those who lost their lives on 9-11 who have died from 9-11 related illnesses. It's an 83 foot tractor trailer that opens into 1100 square foot interactive museum, a tool to educate people through interactive learning and first hand accounts. It has visited over 100 towns across the country and over 500,000 people have visited it. This is my fifth tour with the exhibit and uh, it's my first in about two and a half years. I'm very honored to be out here in Gurney to bring you this exhibit. Uh, before I continue, I just want to bring, uh, bring your attention to a note that my partner, if I can find it, Kevin Calhoun gave me very nice words. So I want to ask you all, if you can remember these FDNY firefighters who died in the last two weeks. Firefighter Timothy Klein, age 31, was killed in the line of duty while operating a third alarm in Brooklyn, New York. Firefighter John Bigelotti, engine 159, on May 4th. Firefighter Richard Evers, rescue two, on May 10th. Firefighter Alfred and Estonia, engine 71, on May 11th. These three men all retired from service due to 9-11 related illnesses 20, from 20 years ago. Tunnel to Towers will never forget their sacrifice and in their honor, we continue to do good for others who gave so much. So at this time, I would list, uh, we have a Gold Star family. Uh, well, there was a Gold Star family. I, I don't know if she got here yet, but I'd just like to mention her name. Uh, her husband was an uh, uh, Illinois state trooper and he was killed in the line of duty. Uh, and they paid the mortgage for their home that's Mrs. Ellis and her family. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you firefighter Sam Hiller, who will sing the national anthem for us. sign up for time slots uh, that'll give you an opportunity uh, to come through the exhibit so again thank you uh, enjoy um,
I wanted to thank also, excuse me for being a little tardy with this, but I wanted to thank uh, two groups that brought this exhibit out here, the Lake County Fire Chiefs and also the Lake Villa Firefighter Association. Thank you very much for bringing this exhibit out to Gurney, Illinois. Yay.
the robots just give us the ability to do that. So what he's going to do is he'll lock the robot all the way up. Um, the disruptor for this particular uh, demonstration is just water. Um, it's basically like a shotgun blast, but it is just water. It's eight ounces of water. But you'll see it can uh, get the job done pretty well. And obviously we can operate this remotely, we can send this robot into buildings, we can send it down range and parking lots, it has quite a bit of range for us to move about. very nimble, it can move around, it has multiple wheels on the front and back. If we need this thing to go upstairs, um, climb hills, it can do any terrain. Alright, gonna hear a little bit of a loud burst here. Was just a little bit of water. <laughs> Chief, you okay back there? All right. <laughs> We're going to get back in here while the Deerfield crew gets suited up. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. My name is Bob Kleinheins. I'm the uh, in charge of the Fire Prevention Bureau at Lake Zurich. And what we're going to show you here today is a demonstration of a sprinklered house and a non sprinklered house. So when I say sprinklers, uh, multiple towns now in Lake County require sprinklers in all new construction. So I came from Libertyville, it was fully sprinklered. Lake Zurich's fully sprinklered. Uh, countryside, Vernon Hills right behind me, they're fully sprinklered. So all new construction, townhomes, single family homes, all have fire sprinklers in them now. And the reason we're putting fire sprinklers in houses is because we need to do more to get people safely out. So what the sprinkler does is it activates right where the fire is. Only one sprinkler head goes off, it's right where the fire is. If it needs another sprinkler head because the fire is not completely out, another sprinkler will go off, okay? But what you'll see today is one sprinkler head activate right over the fire. So you see the side that says fire sprinkler protected? That has one single sprinkler head in it and a sprinkler plus a smoke detector throughout your house the way the state requires it, which is every level and outside of every bedroom, that's going to get you safely out of your house. So if you're looking to do any new construction, make sure you talk to one of us because we can point you in the direction of people that are here today to talk to you about sprinklers or, so, or your local fire department. Just call your local fire department and they can get, it, get you information. The other side, uh, it says unprotected. That side just has a smoke detector. You're going to hear the smoke detector go off for a few seconds and then it's going to stop because the fire will melt the smoke detector off. So that side we go to what's called flashover. Flashover occurs today in about three minutes. Flashover is a occurrence in your home where you can't get out of the house. It's where everything in the room or everything on the floor starts on fire all at once. In the old days when I was the first new kid on the fire department, flashover was about 12 minutes. Today, flashover is about three minutes. And that's because everything we own in our house today is made out of yellow powder, plastic. Plastic is gasoline. That's what it's made out of. It's a petroleum product, okay? Back in the old days, it was all made out of wool, heavy cotton, heavy wood. Things burned, but they burned a lot slower. We had a lot more time to get in and do our job. We actually had time to get you guys out. If you stop and think about it, before we get going here, I want you to think about a timeline, okay? When the fire starts, just watch your clock. We're gonna let this go because today, the normal response time for a fire department, we're judged yeah. and we're graded on it six minutes. Time of the alarm, time of the phone call to the time we get to your house, it's supposed to be six minutes or less. 
The problem is nobody calls us. Nobody has telephones. Everybody loses their phone. Nobody grabs their cell phone. No one has a hard phone anymore. So we're not getting called for three, four, five minutes. Today's average response time across the United States is about 12 minutes. And that's because we're not getting the phone call until you're outside, hopefully, oh, hey, you up? run your neighbor, your neighbor calls us, so I, three, right, four, we'll five minutes has now gone by, yeah. now add the response time. It's not because we're not still as good as ever, we're not oh, yeah. getting the notification like we should. So that's where the sprinkler comes in, because that sprinkler head will go off in about 40 seconds or less. So that's putting water on the fire, 30, 40 seconds, and you're getting your family out, okay? So what we're gonna do today is, when I know the Deerfield guys are ready, we're gonna light the fire on the right, which says unprotected. We're gonna light that first. A couple of you with times on your clock or on your watch, just time when you see that fire. When you first see the fire, and then think about what you're gonna do. What, what's your first thing in your house, if that's your house? You know, your first action is gonna to be to get your family out. So that's why a lot of people don't even think about calling, because you're working to get your family out. All right? Okay, we're going to light the unprotected side, folks. You also have to remember this has an open side to it. So, you know, picture this as a room in your house with a normal four, uh, four walls, not an open side. All we've got are regular, we just have newspapers and a couch. We've got the same furniture on each side, nothing different. There's our smoke detector. So once you see that smoke, now you can start watching your clock. People over here are lucky yeah, they can okay. see a lot more fire. The fire's already up the back of the wall coming across the ceiling. You haven't gotten out of your bed yet. You're hoping that the detector's gonna wake you up now. And now you're, you're yelling for your children. You're yelling for help. You're trying to get to that spot outside. Exit drills, practice your exit drills. You can see the color difference in the smoke now. See how deadly that smoke is? We're talking about temperature soon, it'll be five, six, seven, eight hundred degrees. If this is downstairs, this is going up your stairwell. It's going up the stairs into the bedroom, unprotected. We haven't been called yet. Think about the timeline. So now the fire's really rocking. It's coming out of the room, it's coming into your hallway. Anybody watching a time or a clock? We're, we're about in a minute, about a minute and a half. We're almost at flashover. We gotta wait one second here to make sure the guys are safe. Oh yeah, I feel. Oh yeah, <laughs> well, here's guys. You can see the devastation, right? We're not at the house yet. Stop and think about what we talked about. We hope we've been notified. This has only been a little over two minutes. So now think about that spreading. That's why when you see the sprinkler, you'll see such a huge difference in what you can do in your home. is how long you're out of your home. The unprotected side, you're out of your house a year. I can guarantee you, you've been doing this for 48 years. You're not coming back into your home. The sprinkler side, you'll probably be back in your home in a couple of days. There it goes. Okay, fire's at the curtain. Fire's coming across the ceiling. Maybe 10 seconds we have water on the fire already. The sprinkler's gone off. One sprinkler's controlling. You, you guys here, you all felt the heat from before, right? So now we walk right up to it. You know, we're just getting wet, that's it. Now your family wakes up, you come right out. You come right down through what I just was walking in. 
you run out of your house, get to your meeting spot, you're safe. That's going to run until we get there. It's going to put the fire out. Okay, everybody, can please give the Deerfield guys a round of applause. Thanks, guys. That was nice. That was fun. Okay, my name is Alex. I'm from Tops Kennels. Are you guys ready for a demonstration? Okay. <coughs> we have John Florenza with Dax, well known dog. Corns a lot, does a lot of different things. What are you going to learn today? You're going to understand how, what it takes to train a dog, what the maintenance is. It's very important. So when we purchase a dog, we mostly use German Shepherds. I want to always ask why we are Shepherds versus other breeds. German Shepherd can handle the cold, they can handle the heat. Everyone knows what a Rottweiler is, they cannot handle the heat. Everyone knows what a, a Doberman is, they cannot handle the cold. Right there. So we're looking for a dog that's all around. What's nice about the Shepherd, it becomes be a family dog, and at the same, John has three kids, four kids, four kids. So it could be a family dog, but at the same time, he could be his police dog too. So we're looking for a dog with the right temperament. What we do, we purchase a dog in between the age of 10 months and preferably a year and two months, so a 14 month old dog. Everyone says, why do we want such a young dog? We want the dog to be able to take on the dog, the personality of the person he is with. If we get a three year old dog, that dog is set. If he's afraid of lightning, he's afraid of lightning. We can't change it. When we get a 10 month old dog, a year old dog, and we see, uh, let's say, lightning bugs him a little bit. What you're gonna learn today, I have a toy in my back pocket, I had my pocket here. So everyone says, what are you looking for in a dog? We're looking for a dog that has good hips. We get his hips x-rayed, we get his elbows x-rayed, we get his shoulders x-rayed. And we're getting at a young age, they have to be almost excellent to perfect. And everyone says, why is that? Because if we have a dog that's a year old, he's got a little flaw on his hip when he's a year old, chances when he's two year old, that flaw becomes a big flaw. So the first thing we do, we x-ray the dog, and then we purchase a dog. We pay anywhere from $6,000 to $8,000 for it. Now he'll walk forward with the dog, make him heal. He'll do a right about turn. He stops, makes the dog sit. You notice the dog looks at one person, and that's the person he admires, just like John admires his dog. He's looking at one thing too, and that's his dog. Walk forward, make him heal. Stop, make him sit. Dogs are conditioned for this weather. When we go through this class, it's really very funny because we had eight new guys and they came and uh, when it got real hot out Monday, it was very hot, and watching everyone sit so in the shade with their dog. He said, for the next 500 hours, you guys will not be in the shade at all. The dogs stay in the sun, you stay in the sun. Everyone says, well, why is that? If you let these dogs know what shade is when they're looking for a missing person that's 95 degrees out and they're tracking in the middle of the field and they see shade and every time you when it's hot you don't go shade, they run to the shade. So these dogs do not know what shade is. They enjoy being with the handler, hot, cold, or whatever. The dog is trained to stay on his left hand side if he takes a step to his right, tells the dog to heal, the dog comes right to his side. If he tells the dog stay, takes a step backwards, tells the dog to heal, the dog comes right to his side. If he stands on the wrong side of the dog, tells the dog to heal, tells the dog to heal, the dog always comes to his side. If you look at the handler, what side is the gun on? His right side. Do we want the dog by the gun? No, he's also here, he's, he's here, here, he is trained. If he hears gunfire, be it from John, bad guy, or another officer, all the dog does is hit the ground. He lies down instantly. So if John is looking for someone in a wooded area and also there's gunfire, John isn't that, I mean, the dog's not the only one going down. John's going down due to get out of sight. The dog is only used during gunfire if he feels he can save an officer's life, a civilian's life, then the dog is used in place of that to stop the person. Now he'll walk forward again, do another about turn. He's going to tell the dog stop, make him sit. He'll tell the dog stay, he'll walk to the end of the leash. He's going to use a hand signal and voice command and down the dog. Then he goes and praises the dog for doing a good job. He'll walk forward again, make him heal. Do another about turn. He'll stop and down the dog. 
Go to the end of the leash, face the dog. Use the hand signal voice command, make him sit. Then we go next, we take the leash off. Dog has to work on and off leash just like you would. These dogs are trained to ignore other animals, other dogs, cats, squirrels, whatever you want. Think they're trained to completely stay. And if you notice the dog focuses on one person, that is John. Then we'll walk forward, make a meal. Put him up, turn. Go walk fast. Do another about turn, go slow. This time you'll leave him on the sit while he's walking. Then he'll face the dog. He'll use the hand signal only down the dog. Walks around the dog, goes back to his side, praises him. Now you notice that dog's tail's wagging 90 miles an hour. He's doing one thing, he loves to work, loves to work. And this is the breeding. This is what you're paying for when you buy a new dog. You're paying for the temperament of the dog. At the same time, this dog is when you see he's aggressive, he's aggressive. But then when he is home, he's a family dog. Walk forward, make him heal again. This time he'll leave him on a down while he's walking. Now he'll use the hand signal only and make him sit. Go back to the dog side, walk around him. Now you guys watch how he's going to reward this dog. He'll tell the dog to stay, go 10 feet away. I'll count to three, now you guys watch. The difference is why does the dog love this toy? It's quality time that John spends with his dog. The phone ring is not going to answer, the dog knows it. Now you have to remember when John does find a person two miles away hiding in the woods and let's say it's a missing child, what's a dog's reward for finding that missing child? That toy. And he will play, if it took him two hours to find that person, he will play two hours all the way back. That's a dog's reward. One, two, three. Yo! Now watch him play with the dog. That's the boy. Let's have a big hand for John and his canine. Now when we train these dogs to find drugs, when we initially train them, we use a pseudo-drug. And everybody says, why do you use a pseudo-drug? When we're working with real cocaine, real heroin, meth, when we're working with all these drugs, if the dog would get a hold of them, we could have a dead dog. So in the beginning, till the handler understands this dog, we use a pseudo-drug. This is a drug that looks like real drugs, smells like real drugs, but cannot harm the dog or handler. We need a license to carry that just like real drugs. Why? Because, John, what would happen if someone would sell pseudo drugs? What would they be charged with? Selling bad drugs. Yeah. <laughs> They'd be the same charge for doing that as real drugs. So what's going to happen, now you see a different side of this dog. What's going to happen, John puts a different collar on this dog. Again, Nick is going to put contamination in that box. He is putting pseudo cocaine in the box. Now, for you understand, when a dog is looking for drugs, you're actually telling him he'd be crazy, he can tear apart a couch, he can eat through a wall, in training, he can do whatever he wants to get a hold of the drug. Okay? There's two ways to train a dog for drugs. There's a passive way. When a dog finds drugs, he sits down. And there's an aggressive way, and that's where they dig and scratch. We prefer the aggressive way for one reason. If you have a pile of clothes and 50 shoes sitting there and a dog sits down, well, we gotta go through every shoe. You gotta remember, when drugs are hidden, it can be a shoe that has a false bottom where you move the heel and there are drugs in there. The dog, this dog is trained when he looks for drugs, he goes right to source and he destroys it. So, if it's in a shoe, you got 50 shoes, you're talking 20 seconds, this dog will do 50 shoes, you go to the shoe that has drugs and it'll attack and start digging down. Very important that you have a very wise handler that he watches that the drugs would not fall out and everything. So now, this is, we're pretending this is the first day this dog is looking for drugs. What's going to happen, he will throw the toy to, to Nick. Nick will tease the dog. Everybody says, what's tease me? All he's got to do is sit there and hold and go, I got it. And you feel this dog getting raged. He goes, I want that. Then he throws it in the box that has drugs. Dog runs up. When he grabs his toy, what's he smell? Drugs. He doesn't know why yet. First day. Here we go. Yo, 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 yo. Let's go. And a boy. Yo. Runs up, grabs it. He smells the drugs. Now we put three other boxes out there. We have our drug box. Okay. I am going to put a toy in the drug box. Nick is going to trick him. Nick is going to trick him. He's going to throw him the toy. He's going to act like he puts it in the first box. 
Dog runs up. Well, this is the I'm going to grab my toy. Nothing there. John directs in the next box. Nothing there. John directs in the third box. Nothing there. John directs into the fourth box. What is there? The toy and the smell of what? It's drugs. You got it. Okay, here we go. And why do you get the dogs crazy? It's fun. If someone here. Okay, here. Let's, 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 let's go. Okay, he acts like he puts in the first box. <laughs> there you go. Dog runs up. Nothing here. Nothing there. No oh, there it is. Now he's understanding it. Every time he smells the smell of drugs, because this is cocaine, what else is there? What else is there? The toy. Okay, now just so you understand, we'll get rid of all these boxes. We'll put all the, we're going to put boxes out that have holes in them, but no drugs in them. Just so you can see, this dog is going to smell each hole. And when he's done, he did a good job smelling the holes, he gets a toy. Okay, so when he does do your house, and he does the first bedroom, there's nothing in the bedroom, he still gets a toy for searching good. Finding drugs is an extra bonus. So now he puts the boxes out here. Every box has a hole in it, as you can see. Because we don't care, we care that the dog indicates on the hole. Why is that? Because when you do a closed box, what's he going to smell? He's smelling the seams of all the boxes, not the box. So now John is going to direct the dog to find drugs. Okay? The dog will smell each hole, and he praises the dog for doing a good job. Then you watch how he rewards the dog. So nothing. Nothing, good boy. And he praises the dog for doing a good job. Nothing. Now he praises the dog for doing a good job. Now you're going to see we put a box that's contaminated. We have drugs in this box, okay? So now John will start. Uh, he'll start on this box, works his way around. When a dog smells that hole, what does he think's in the box? Druggies. His toy, okay? How's he going to get to his toy? He'll dig, that won't work, what will he do? He'll eat the box. In real life, would he let him do that? No, because we were real drugs. In training, they get to destroy anything for the drugs. Okay, so he starts box number one. And the reason you're sitting the dog is to make him relax. So it's a no-win situation. I mean, no-lose-win situation. When he comes to the one with the drugs, watch what happens. Okay, here we go. Boom! Yeah, you want that? Good boy! Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it! Let's have a big hand for the canine. Four. The toy is anywhere the drugs are. What he's going to do, now you got to understand, you'll put a little pseudo drugs in the holes on top there. The dog will indicate by digging and scratching. While he's digging in and scratching, you got to listen carefully. While he's digging in and scratching, John will pull the dog back and he'll reach in the box, the top of the box, it acts like he's picking something up. And then he'll hold nothing up, and on the count of three, he'll throw nothing down, I'll throw the toy. So if the drugs are in a big pen, you put it between your two front feet, he digs on it, you pull him back, you reach in like you're getting something, and how does he do that when we're not there? When this dog's digging on the trunk of a car, he takes a toy, throws it behind him, praises the dog, pulls him back, reaches in that closed trunk, turns around, throws nothing down, it's there. So this dog thinks the toy is everywhere. Okay, now I'll do the same thing. <clears throat> Makes the toy disappear. And that's him saying I want to work. Okay, now you guys watch. Dad, oh boy, dig, 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 Dad, boy, now he pulls it back, and he reaches in there like he's getting something. He holds nothing up. 
On a count of three, watch. One, two, three. There you go. Where's the dog take the toy cane? His hand. Okay, so we can make that toy be in a light socket. We can make that toy be in a crack in a wall. We can make that toy be in a little hole in a tree. The dog thinks the toy. Let's have another big hand for John. So when the dog is looking for drugs, what's he looking for? His toy. Marijuana, cocaine, heroin. All these drugs will make his toy appear. The dog is trained to do one thing, bite and hang on. He's not trained to bite a person all over the body. He goes for the first thing you grab, he hangs on. And then you respond to the officer, stop moving, lay down the ground. You will stop moving, lay on the ground. It's not like TV. You can't fight a dog like this. You will lose instantly, real quick. And this dog knows this. So, so what happens first, we show you the control. Nick's gonna walk around the dog. He will not be aggressive, he just walks around the dog. And the dog just pays attention to him, but shouldn't do nothing. Then we'll have Nick walk away, and he's going to put a sleeve on now. And he'll walk around the dog again, and the dogs are trained in a full suit. They'll bite your leg, they'll bite your shoulder, they'll bite anything. Nick is the one who makes him bite the sleeve. Okay, now he walks around again, no aggression shown. That dog should not bite unless the person becomes aggressive or John tells him to bite. So now he'll walk around again. And as soon as he becomes aggressive, watch the dog respond. Now if you watch the bite on this dog, it's all the way back, fully back, and it's hanging on. The harder the bad guy fights, the harder the dog bites. He's trained to hang on as hard as he can until the handler tells the bad guy to. Okay, now you guys get to see in demonstration, in training the toy is used. On the street there is no toy. Because the dog has to pay way out to, to the bad guy. And the dog should not move unless the person breaks. We'll do two frisks without breaking. Okay? Dog pays attention but should not do anything. Then he goes back and he praises the dog. Don't forget praise, praise, praise. Dogs will work all day long for praise. Watch you out again and first start bad guy. Again, the pay, dog pays attention. It happens. Next time, Nick will become aggressive. John has to say nothing. As soon as this dog feeds that John's in jeopardy, that's it. He goes. And watch how hard. Good boy. Dog just hangs on. He can wrap his feet around the dog. And if you watch, the dog engulfs him. He gets his mouth as far back as he can. Just to hang on that person. Should not let go of that person at all. Should not let go. And dogs are trained to push. So when you fight with a dog, he, he wants to get you just where he had him on the ground there. And then again, the dog just hangs on. If you look, that's all the way back in his mouth. Dog is trained to hang on to one spot, not bite all over the body. Boy, the minimal smart. damage he can do is fourteen and hang. And again, the dog hangs on until our officer says the magical words of. Stop fighting! Stop fighting with the dog. Out! Heel. Good boy. <coughs> there you go. Under arrest! Show me all the handles on the dog. And the dog doesn't care if he's moving or not moving. He's Last told to go, he goes. Show me your left hand, I'll send the dog. The dog will bite you. And the dog, boom. And the harder he fights, the harder he bites. The dog just hangs on as he's there for. In real life, John covers the dog. He has his gun out, he has it drawn. He's there to protect the dog. So if anything's going to happen to the dog, John is there to protect the dog. The dog's there to protect him. And is this a big part of training, it's not a big part of training, it's the most, most important part. It could be today where someone wants to end John's life, this dog has to stop him. Then you just see the bite, the dog just hangs on, does not stop let go, hangs on. Out! 
you. There we go. Let's have a hand for John and Max. Touch, touch. Okay, here we go. So in a case like this, we're going to make sure the victims are okay, but we got to get off this car. we got to get the one black car off the blue car in order to possibly save somebody who's underneath, okay? So not te technically conventional, but just showing you some of the resources that we have here in the county, okay, in partnership with some of the local wreckers that have these tools like you're seeing this big record, this crane, this cable, this hook. Fire department doesn't have that. So typically we're going to have to have the vehicle stabilized. At the bottom you can probably see some wood chalking under the frame or the tires. figure out where exactly they want to make sure that that, that cable's hooked up to the framing. As you can see, the webbing, the purple webbing coming on the rear of the tires, out to a chain. On the trunk of the black car there. Of course, it takes a team, a lot of communication. checks and balances, making sure people are cleared away, we can show the, see the strength of these vehicles, or strength of these wildwood wrecker when it starts to lift that black, black vehicle off the blue one. Okay, it's being slowly raised. chains. And that's approximately a two-ton vehicle there. Should be about 4,000 pounds. We still got to make sure we're clear of that blue vehicle so that these fire rescue crews can get in there to start extrication should there be a victim that needs to be taken out. forward. So the fire service does work hand in hand with some of the local wreckers, a lot of their public works, crews in their villages or towns, based on some of the equipment they have and we don't. We all work together for a better community. So you can see on the blue vehicle he was starting to use a halogen bar, that's what it's referred to, do a little uh, puncture point and then now they have a cutter, going to snap uh, 
looks looks like one of the posts. And they also get the spreaders, which a lot of people refer to as the jaws of life, so that they can remove that driver's side door. If we're going to pop windows, typically we're going to have, have a victim covered, keep the glass off them if we need that access. Some of those tools there, the spreaders, we're looking at about 100 pounds, 75 to 100 pounds. The one cutter to the left on the blue vehicle, looking at 50 pounds. So after a while, it does get heavy, particularly when you're wearing those, those bunker coats, pants, helmets, boots, gloves. It gets awfully warm on a day like today. Looks like the Lake Bluff crew is going to be over on that black vehicle. They're starting to stabilize it. I want to make sure that vehicle is not going to roll. It looks like Lincolnshire Riverwood's got that driver's side door open. If they were to access a victim at the steering wheel. You go through a lot of blades, depending on how much cutting you have to do. So they're going to methodically remove the roof, if I'm not mistaken, of that blue vehicle. fluid, possibly gasoline, so we're going to want to have some hose lines pulled and application of foam if possible. We would use foam on a, a flammable liquid fire. Looks like I have the, the driver's side door off of the blue vehicle, and that took them about three minutes. Got the cutters working over here with the Lincoln Lake Bluff for fire rescue. They use that halogen bar to pop a hole in the tire that helps stabilize the vehicles as well. getting that the roof off for the blue vehicle here as you can see they cut across the bottom of that windshield takes a team there to flip that all right nice one piece right to the junkyard with that top Sometimes we have to have a paramedic inside there while they're doing that, maintaining C-spine stabilization, 
maybe starting an IV, administering medications, oxygenation, just depending on what's going on. Obviously, this would be considered a heavy damage vehicle accident. They use those 4x4s again to stabilize. You can see that car can move around a little bit. I think he's putting the spreader in there between the doorway. Looks like, looks like Blake Bluff's got the one door just about popped here. And passenger side door as well. Sometimes things don't go to occur in the plan. You have to go to plan B. Might need another tool. Might need another crew. Looks like that passenger, passenger door here on the, on the black's about to come on. And nowadays with batteries in these vehicles, these hybrid vehicles, these electric vehicles, you gotta be very concerned about that. safety the gasoline was removed from these vehicles okay so we know that's not going to be an issue and it's definitely not as as easy as some of these guys are making it look that's for sure actually is also considered a training as well for these guys using these tools. We're required to put so many hours in each year handling the hydraulic extrication tools. They got the front door off that front passenger off the black. Looks like they got the two driver's side doors removed here in about 10 minutes. I know it seems like it's longer, but it's, it's only been about 10 minutes. see why it would be very important to wear your seatbelt. Buckle up every trip, every time. Moms, dads, make sure your children are in those car seats, booster seats, and buckled up. Don't be driving intoxicated, okay? Stop the text, stop the wrecks. Distracted driving is on the huge increase causing accidents. Put the phone down and drive. Give yourself more time than you need to get where you're going. That'll help slow you down. A 
One text or call could wreck it all. Looks like they finally got that last door off. Nice job over there, Lake Bluff. Looks like you guys here on the blue vehicle are trying to do a dash roll. That's right, they're trying to move that dash up and forward. They had somebody's legs pinned under there. Call it a dash roll. Raising up the dashboard so that we can remove a victim that might be trapped underneath. Put their legs jammed under there. So we have a level one trauma center here in the county and that's a huge resource. Same thing, it looks like they're trying to remove the roof of that black vehicle after they got those doors removed. And again, they're just showing you the effects of some of these tools that we have on our Rescue squads, okay? Not all apparatus is, is with these tools, so some of these are special squads as they're referred to. There's another nice roof for the junkyard. Take it right to the recycle room. And you see going down the road has these jaws of life, okay? They're specialty tools. And lots of times they're coming on these specialty vehicles. Not only is there training, but you got maintenance of these tools. You get service regularly, check regularly. Make sure they're in operating condition so when an emergency rises, they're ready to go. And I'd like to thank Wildwood Records for coming out, participating in the Lake County Fire Chiefs Fire Safety Expo. Great partner to have here in the county. Appreciate Lake Bluff Fire Rescue and Lincolnshire Riverwoods crews taking time to demonstrate this to the residents of Lake County as well. But these guys are in such good shape they're probably not even breaking a sweat.
thank you folks for coming out today and checking all this out. A lot of different demonstrations. Some great resources. <clears throat> it looks like uh, Lingachai Riverwoods has freed all the victims from that vehicle and Lake Bluff has freed all the victims from the Black Lincoln here, the town car. The rest is kind of a mop up, clean up, record service, Wildwood will be hauling them away.